Hello, fellow Rebel Capitalists. Hope you're well. I really hope you guys had a fantastic holiday and a great Thanksgiving weekend. I was able to hang out with family and friends, and uh, that was a, definitely a nice treat. So hopefully you guys got to experience the same thing. I've got a lot of people around the world that are pushing back on authoritarianism. I've seen this. If you guys are on Twitter, I probably won't see it in the news, but all over Europe, uh, I think what I've been saying on the Rebel Capitalist channel a lot lately is that the people who really value freedom and uh, want to push back on authoritarianism, I think we're the silent majority. And I think you're seeing that play out in Europe over the weekend. And uh, I'm just hoping that uh, the silent majority is going to start becoming the vocal majority. And it looks like we're headed that direction. I think that's the, the best way for us to win this fight for freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism is by us coming together as a community and practicing civil disobedience. And uh, it looks like that's what we're seeing. So that's good news. Uh, if you guys haven't yet, make sure you get your tickets to Rebel Capitalist Live. That is January 7th through the 9th, Houston. And we've got about 500 or so tickets sold. And so we're getting, we're not at capacity yet, uh, but it would be very wise to get your tickets uh, sooner than later. Uh, that's for sure. Last time I had a ton of people the last two weeks that were trying to text me and get tickets. And I said, you know, there's nothing I can do. We're completely maxed out. So uh, definitely get your tickets for Rebel Capitalist Live at rebelcapitalistlive.com. All right, let's get into your questions. What do we got tonight? Okay, where are some jurisdictions that you like gold, silver storage? Um, your backyard. <laughs> I I don't know. It, it's it's tough right now. It's so hard. I just don't trust jurisdictions. It's not 2019. That's for sure. It's not 2019. So uh, I don't really uh, trust a lot of these governments that come out with these lockdowns. And uh, I would prefer just my backyard if possible. I'd pr probably prefer a Rolex uh, just in my back pocket or on my wrist. Uh, that's probably what I would do personally. Um, but... Yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer for you, Matt. I, I wish I did, but uh, th there are no jurisdictions I like right now. All right, George has no original ideas. Well, that's actually an original uh, comment. That's good. Yes. Uh, in fact, I would encourage Mr. Legacies to go to my last YouTube video, uh, which is a whiteboard video. What, what was that? That was uh, Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste, The Global Elite's Plan to Take Over the World. Uh, I would challenge Mr. Legacy to watch that whiteboard video and then go ahead and reaffirm your comment that I have no original ideas. <laughs> uh, it is true. I talk about Snyder and Lynn and all these people I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and I try to explain uh, their ideas. Uh, but to say that I've done, what, maybe 400 uh, whiteboard videos now since 2019, I've done uh, countless amounts of interviews, uh, live streams just like this where I answer questions any question uh, right off the top of my head. I think I do so in a reasonably convincing way. I don't think I could just fake it until I make it <laughs> on these live streams if I had absolutely no original ideas. And then on top of that, on the Rebel Capitalist channel, I do four, five, six, sometimes seven live streams, videos a day. And in a lot of those, I take calls directly. And I talk about the news and I give my opinion on the news. And uh, I think I, every once in a while, I'll throw an original idea. 
Uh, also, Rebel Capitalist Pro, uh, Rebel Capitalist Live, uh, the Collective Mastermind Group. I guess uh, other people do those, but uh, maybe not in this space. Uh, also, and the Fed. I'm not sure how many people have sued the Fed. Um, I'm guessing maybe not that many. So I don't know if you'd consider that an original idea or uh, maybe an original action. But regardless, I think that may be a slightly unfair characterization. <laughs> oh, what I love is when people's comments are so ridiculous that it makes them look ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on here. Question, thoughts on REITs as a more liquid proxy for real estate investing? I don't really like that, James, because I like to be in control or more control of my investments. And uh, there's just a lot of fees that are involved there. And uh, I mean, you might be able to find a good one that maybe dealt with uh, nursing homes or something that has uh, some serious tailwind as far as demographics um, if you just absolutely don't want to be involved with tenants and toilets uh, I get it but uh, I, I would prefer the, the being kind of in charge of my own destiny a little bit more uh, also with owning some real estate I think that would make you a better REIT investor because you would know what to look for and what uh, what to avoid as far as management um, and then with the REITs, obviously, you've got to do your homework. You've got to be extremely careful. Um, not, not all REITs are created equal. So that would just kind of be my, my tips for investing in REITs. What is my go-to watch to wear and why? Is today a good time to buy a watch? And do consider do, uh, do I consider watches be a good investment? I do. I do. Maybe, maybe not a good investment because I would define that as something that pays me to own it. Uh, and I would not consider a watch even a good speculation, but I would consider it insurance. That's the one thing, or maybe diesel trucks. I got to throw that in there. Uh, the specific diesels, you know, the Fords from... Uh, 94 and a half, let's say 95 to 2002. But uh, th that's kind of the, the two things that uh, I, I never really talk about uh, that I would consider insurance, just like gold, is uh, our, our specific watches, Rolexes. Uh, I wouldn't really mess around with anything else. But if you can get a good uh, Rolex that's in good shape with the box and the papers at a, at a very good price, I think the probability of that maintaining its purchasing power long term is very high. And also, I really like it because, uh, you know, you can have a $40,000 gold Rolex, like a Submariner, and uh, you can just throw that on your wrist where, you know, if you had that much $40,000 in gold, uh, that might be a little more uh, cumbersome. So it's just, I think, a, a great thing to own. Now, as far as... Uh, one to wear uh i wouldn't wear a rolex pretty much unless you just liked it but uh I, it's it's up to you really i i wear uh i've got a few different ones usually i just wear this uh is a hublot king power it's like one of the the big the big ones the 48 millimeter because my hands are pretty big uh so if i get a kind of a small watch it looks ridiculous but, um, I mean, this isn't going to be a good investment, that's for sure. Uh, a watch like this, I'd just try to get it used. So, uh, you know, one that's in good shape because it's most likely going to depreciate a little bit. Maybe not a lot like a car, but uh, it'll probably depreciate a bit. It's not like a Rolex. The Rolex is the good investment. Uh, this is just kind of one that's just fun to kind of wear around. Has Galt Gulch been created? Not that I know of, but it's it's fascinating to see people really thinking about this in greater detail. Um, I'm very impressed with Tim Pool. Uh, I like his show. Uh, I think he's a, a really intelligent kid. So are the other kids on the show. 
And um, I think what he has in West Virginia there, kind of that complex, is a very interesting idea. And uh, I, I think it's it's so you've got a lot of smart people doing stuff like that. And I think that's really encouraging. And uh, I think that's kind of the direction that the world is headed. I mean, let's talk about another one of my non-original ideas for a moment. Uh, <laughs> I uh, sent out a tweet, I believe uh, yesterday or the day prior, where I was thinking about the bond market and the long end of the curve. And, you know, Snyder would argue that uh, the long end of the curve is telling us that uh, consumer price inflation isn't going to be uh, consistent, at least not as a result of there being a, a larger amount of dollars. And that's not only when you include M2, but you also include the dollars that are on the balance sheets of the banking system in the private sector. So that would include Euro dollars and, um, uh, you know, offshore banks, onshore banks, etc. cetera. So uh, it's, it's, you've got this dichotomy that this, really weird between the long end of the curve and what's happened in the stock market. Also, you throw gold in there. You know, why is the price of gold uh, been going down or just kind of flatlined? Why has that not been going up when you see consumer price inflation as measured by the government at 6.2 or 6.4 percent? And all of us know that as far as consumer prices, much higher than that. Um, and even if we are in a scenario that isn't technically uh, inflation and an increase in the money supply overall. And even if it is uh, a result of supply shocks, uh, the fact of the matter is that, that prices are, are still going up tremendously. And uh, if you were in bonds, uh, you would have lost a lot of purchasing power, assuming that you're holding those to maturity. So why is it that the bond market isn't telling us the same thing that it told us back in the early 1950s? And uh, that is that we're going to see the next few decades of uh, significant inflation and ever increasing inflation and ever increase, increasing uh, bond yields. Therefore, price is going down. And I, I think that if you look around the world, uh, the bond market has been telling us for the last six months, while everyone's been excited about vaccines and reopenings and yada, 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 I think what the bond market was trying to tell us is, hey, guys, uh, you're getting ahead of yourself. And although we might see consumer prices go up as a result of supply chain disruptions and shortages due to government-induced economic distortions, what we will also see in the future is uh, additional lockdowns and a reduction in economic output globally uh, due to governments taking either the same approach they took in March of 2020, or an even more extreme approach. And uh, so you could say, well, George, that's kind of one in the same, that uh, the bond market is still just telling us there's going to be reduced economic output. And that may be true, but I think it is important as investors to realize why the bond market is telling us uh, that there's going to be less economic output in uh, 2022 and maybe into 2023. Uh, especially if you're someone that values freedom, liberty, free market capitalism, and wants to push back on central planners. Uh, so that's, <clears throat> excuse me, an idea that I haven't heard anyone articulate. And uh, I think that's kind of my base case right now, honestly, is that uh, as if we continue to see the bond market uh, flatten at the long end, that's going to signal to us that not only should we expect lower global economic output, but we should also expect to see more draconian and authoritarian, authoritarian measures taken by global governments. Uh, what we see in Australia, as an example, the bond market could be telling us that we should expect to see something like that in Europe as well. And, it's, and if it continues to go down, it's meaning the yields, uh, then I think it would say that, hey, you guys should can expect to see that in certain states in the United States, maybe California, maybe uh, New York, um, Washington, Oregon, etc. cetera. So um, 
I would really look at the gold market and uh, the yield curve moving forward, uh, not just to predict what's going to happen with the economy, but maybe more so what's going to pre- what's going to happen with uh, lockdowns, medicine mandates, and uh, maybe taking it to the extent that we're seeing in certain parts of Australia where they're even sending people to quarantine camps and not just people who have uh, tested positive, but also people who have been within a certain proximity of people who have tested positive. Um, Just something to think about. How exactly is currency destroyed? Does the Fed have tools to increase the rate of currency destruction in the event of hyperinflation? Mm, Yeah, kind of. Kind of. I think there's an argument there that uh, increasing interest rates could do that uh, because the amount of dollars being created by the commercial banking system theoretically goes down because interest rates are so high therefore no one can afford to take out a loan therefore the only thing that's happening on the bank's balance sheets uh, uh, is dollars are being paid or loans are being paid back and when loans get paid back when there's more loans being paid back than loans being created on net balance that is a destruction of dollars i think also the government could try an mmt approach where they increase taxes i don't think that would work but on paper, it would work. I, I just think that's one of those things that looks neat in a textbook that you could just jack tax rates up to 90% and take all those dollars out of the system. And then you'd have nothing to worry about. But in practice, just people aren't going to pay it. And the dollar is going to circulate with even higher velocity and it's going to just lead to an even bigger disaster. Uh, but you could argue that that might be a tool. I mean, assuming that. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet is back to where it was prior to the GFC. Um, uh, and then another thing they could just uh, see, they don't have, the problem is they don't have many capital reserves. Uh, maybe they could sell gold to buy dollars off the market that would destroy dollars that they could get really creative um i mean who knows maybe they just do a bail-in maybe just do a a mass (laughs) bail-in i i mean after what's happened in 2020 and 21 i mean is anything off the table (laughs) as ridiculous as that sounds as far as a a a national bail-in just to decrease the amount of dollars but I think before we get there, uh, we're going to have price controls. So, uh, I mean, they've been talking about rent controls quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. And uh, that seems to be kind of the, the next stop for the government, assuming that we continue to get these uh, consumer price increases, regardless of whether it's a result of supply chain disruptions or um, quote unquote money printing. George, are you down to one property? I have seven rentals producing 2% cash flow on the equity uh, with uh, 3.1%. Would you? I can't really tell you what to do there. Yes, I am down to one property. And that is going to go on the market here um, probably in the spring because a lot better to sell a house in, in the spring. So I'll probably wait till like March to sell it. But, uh, yep, that's the last one in the United States, at least. As far as what you should do, I, I can't tell you. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure what you're saying. It's a 2% cash flow on the equity. Yeah, that, that's not very good. So I, I, would, I would not be happy with that. But uh, I, I can't really tell you what to do because there's so many other factors in there. But if it were me, I would I would not be happy with that. I would try to put that equity somewhere else where it's uh, it has less downside and paying me more to own it while shorting the dollar with that 30 year fixed rate loan, assuming it's 30 year fixed rate.
Yeah. So Mitchell asked, will you be doing any more videos in the future like the one you did where you took a deep dive into my own YouTube analytics on the George Gammon channel and content creation entrepreneurship? I absolutely will, Mitchell. Uh, probably do one this week on the Rebel Capitalist channel. I'd like to do one once every two or three weeks. And uh, so I'll probably try to announce that ahead of time just because it's not like the other ones on that channel where it's kind of just news driven. Maybe I'll do one Friday morning where we go on there for another hour or hour and a half. And I just answer your questions for anyone who's trying to create content. Uh, I'm really trying to help people do that because I think if we could get an extra thousand people out there creating content, whether it's a podcast, blog post, YouTube channel around freedom, liberty, free market capitalism, that that's going to have a dramatic impact and really move the needle. And so anything I can do uh, to help you guys, I'm all about it. Uh, I've been fortunate to, although I've, I've, ha although I have no original ideas whatsoever, mysteriously, I've been able to grow two YouTube channels in the span of two years to over 1 million views a month. So um, if I can do that with no original ideas whatsoever, uh, just think what you can do with uh, several original ideas of your own. <laughs> Ah, uh, using my strategies, and it's it's not that they're uh, my strategy. Although I have I've got a few there that uh, I think you you might not hear at any other place. But it's really kind of just paying a lot of attention to the the analytics, the, the back end metrics, and uh, then paying attention to what matters as far as the click through rates uh, due to the title and the thumbnail and all that stuff. Uh, it, it really matters, but I think. What's also nice to see is the growth rate that I've had in both of those channels and uh, knowing that it doesn't happen overnight. And uh, so you shouldn't be frustrated. You should just realize that it's a numbers game. And if you do produce good content, then sooner or later, that algorithm is going to pick up your channel. We're talking about YouTube specifically. And uh, your channel is definitely going to grow. I mean, there's uh, several people. In fact, just the, the, the guy that uh, I saw him at, uh, market disruptors with Mark Moss's event a couple weekends ago. I can't remember the name of his channel, but he's someone that uh, I think he was at Rebel Capitalist Pro, and he specifically told me that he started a channel because he saw mine, and uh, now he's at like I think a hundred thousand subscribers or something. I think his name is Economic Ninja, and he does great content. And that's what I I, I just want another thousand people doing that. And if I could somehow help a thousand people or even a hundred people, I mean, just think of the impact that would have in this, uh, in, in just reminding people that if you value freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism, that you're not alone. Sounds like something very trivial, doesn't it? But it's not. I think that may be the most important thing. That, we, that any of us can do is just to remind friends and family uh, who have that belief system, who value freedom, that they're not alone and that they are part of a silent majority. And uh, I just think that's the first step in bringing everyone together as a community and then going out there and doing what we can do to legally uh, practice civil disobedience in a nonviolent way to where the, the governments wake up to the fact that if they continue to do what they're doing, then those politicians most likely will not be reelected. And that, at the end of the day, may not matter, but I think that's the, the best approach we can take right now. I just, I think I used the example last week, and I think it's worth saying again of uh, if you kind of go through a thought experiment of phoenix uh, you, know, you got about four million people here and back in march of 2020 if there would have been three or four hundred guys that would have gone out into the streets with guns and uh, protested the lockdowns and practiced disobedience with guns and whatnot you know they would have gotten wiped out and i'm a big fan of the second amendment i think that everyone uh i don't know that everyone should own a gun but i, I wouldn't force it upon people but i think that uh people who are concerned with their uh, safety and well-being, it might be something good to consider. I think that we should all have that right. That's for sure. 
Um, but if you think about that thought experiment, those five or four or 500 guys would have gotten wiped out like immediately uh, by the police, or the military, what have you. Where if all 4 million people with no guns would have just said, no, we're, we're not going to lock ourselves in a cage. We're going to continue to go out and walk our dog. We're going to continue to open our small business. We're going to continue to go to the gym. Uh, we're going to continue to live our lives. And we may take precautions as we see fit, but we're going to do whatever we want to do. And you government central planners can go ahead and pound sand. What could the military have done? What could the police have done? What could the politicians have done? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's the exact same way the, the Berlin Wall came down. So my whole point there is uh, in order for that to happen, people have to realize they're not alone. And I, I think if more rebel capitalists or whatever we want to call ourselves um, that are out there talking about history, talking about the slippery slope we're on, talking about the facts, uh, the data, the actual quote unquote science, if you want to look at it that way, uh, the macroeconomic implica implications, cost benefit analysis, but really just going back to you know these pr these principles that were talked taught to us by Hayek and Friedman and um, and Hazlitt and uh, Mises and Adam Smith, and uh, you know that that's what's going to remind people that hey, uh, I'm going to be on the right side of history. And therefore, I'm going to continue to stand up for what I believe in. And those are the principles that this country was founded on and that, made, that, and that has made it so great up until this point in time. Question. By selling or by selling or buying based on price, they could effectively push all of the speculators out of the space. Hmm. Um, yeah, not following that question. I think maybe that was a two-parter or something. By selling or buying based on price, they could effectively push all the speculators. I don't know. You're talking about a short squeeze there. I'm not sure, Dustin. Thoughts on crude rebounding? That's interesting. You've got two major factors. Number one, on the supply side, I don't think you're going to see a large quantity of supply, especially long term. Maybe short term you might, long term, Probably not because of the whole ESG movement and capital just not going into the creation of more carbon-based energy, let's say. On the demand side, though, I think you could get uh, a demand shock in the next three or four months, six months maybe, due to what the bond market is or was trying to tell us, in my opinion. And that's that uh, what we see in Austria, Germany, Denmark uh, is going to continue and get worse before it gets better. So that, that would lead to a short-term demand shock, which in my opinion would probably be a buying opportunity if, if I was solely focused on price, which I'm not. Now, if uh, oil gets back down to under 30 as a result of the demand shock, if it gets that extreme, then I, I can promise you I will be buying. I will be buying hand over fist <laughs> like I did last time uh, in, in March or April of 2020. So th that's kind of my thoughts. You've got tailwind, headwind, uh, long-term tailwind, maybe short-term headwind based on what the gold market and the bond market are telling us.
What do I think of the best careers young people should consider in new world economy? Well, you, you've got to first and foremost do something you enjoy in a field you enjoy. Because if you're not doing that, you're not going to stick with it. You're not going to have the motivation required to be successful. So what I would suggest is just trying to find uh, an industry that you really like and then someone in that industry who is where you want to be in 10, 20, 15 years, whatever, and just go work for that person. Even if you've got to work for free, if, if possible, if you have the resources to do that for a short period of time. Uh, or maybe, you know, you're working your normal job Monday through Friday just to pay the bills. And then on the weekends, you're working for free for that individual to kind of get your foot in the door and learn the the business without having to go through that learning curve on your dime. And maybe even more importantly, without having to do that, uh, go through that learning curve, risking a significant amount of your own savings. Like I'm just thinking about real estate investing as an example. Um, if you go out there and just buy a house and just kind of roll the dice and this baptism by fire, uh, that can be a way to do it, but you're taking quite a bit of risk. And although you're definitely going to learn what to do and what not to do, uh, you could lose a lot of money in the process where if you could get a job, even on the weekends working for someone for free, like a Ken McElroy or a Jason Hartman uh, th and work for them for a year. Number one, uh, if you do a great job, they're most likely going to hire you on a full-time basis. Because it's, it's most people, the socialists and the central planners don't like to admit this. And most of them don't even realize it because they've never actually employed people. But uh, good employees are very hard to find. Very, very hard. And so if you find someone that can really produce, regardless of how you find them, if they're an intern to begin with or you weren't paying, who cares? Uh, you're you're going to give that person a, a position and you're going to compensate them for how much they're producing. And you're going to try to incentivize them uh, and pay them as much as you as you need to uh, or as you can afford to, to to motivate them to stay especially in, in a labor market that's so tight right now, uh, you, you got a lot of leverage. So that's kind of, that would definitely be my approach if I was a young person trying to figure it out. Recommend any histor history investing monetary type books you would recommend? Road to Serfdom, first and foremost. Uh, you have to read that book right now. Even if you've read it in the past, I think you need to reread it. Just viewing it through the context of the world in which we live in today. I think it'll give you, like you'll have five or six epiphany moments and where you'll just have that light bulb go on and you'll just jot down notes so i've got to remember that that's such a good point i see that playing out today next would be for investing i mean i always like the the market wizards books also i i would probably look at that book that jim rogers wrote on commodities because uh, we could be going into a commodity super cycle and I'd be interested to hear his rationale for writing that book. And I think that preceded the last uh, commodity super cycle. And I'd be, I'd be interested to see if there were parallels there. And another great thing about the road to serfdom is it's kind of a history book as well. They go over a lot of history of uh, most notably Nazi Germany that I didn't even really realize prior to uh, reading the book. Uh, the Market Wizards books, I don't know if I mentioned that. I think I did. That's probably where I'd start history investing. And then, you know, you got to listen to Macro Voices, the podcast there. 
I would listen to Snyder's podcast, Making Sense, as well. And if you do that, I think you're going to be off to the races. Oh, you know, also, I would, as far as uh, kind of taking a, a flashback in history, I, I'd watch the Free to Choose series by Milton Friedman on YouTube. And then I would also uh, read Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, because I think it's going to really uh, give you, it's really going to emphasize why there are are no solutions and there are only trade-offs. And I think we live in a world today where that is where that has never been more applicable this idea that you you know we're we've got the cerveza sickness and people like to try to think there's some sort of magic silver bullet that if only we did this the cerveza sickness would be gone if only we did this we would eradicate the cerveza sickness that ain't happening that's not with the tools that we have today that's not going to happen so you're so then the conclusion you come to is well then we either have to lock down and do booster sh- shots uh, periodically for the rest of our lives and continue with mandates and passports and all that fun stuff uh, or you're going to have a certain portion of the population die that's no getting around it no beating around the bush you know we we need to put on our our big boy pants and just realize it is what it is so uh, those are two bad options and even if you have a third or a fourth it's still going to be a bad option and we we have to remember what Thomas Sowell teaches us and he outlines it very well and articulates it very well in basic economics and that is we are especially now living in a world where there are no solutions none zero just trade-offs that's it so what that means is if we have a constrained view and again this is Dr. Thomas Sowell's word if we have a constrained view of the world which I think you should have, uh, compared to an unconstrained view, you realize that using the Cervasa sickness as an example, there are no good options. There's just several bad options. So we have to take the least bad option. The problem is that there's a group of people out there and politicians who like to think that there is a good option. They like to think that there is a solution to the Cervasa sickness. And if we just took more draconian measures, then we could achieve this quote unquote solution. We could achieve this good option. We could we could find this silver bullet. If we just took a more authorita- uh, authoritarian type of approach, then we could achieve this solution. If we just lock down harder, If we just force them more, if we just get them to obey our words, then we would get to a solution. And then you have all the useful idiots out there that are saying, oh, yep, that, yep, yep, yep. We got to be safe. Got to be safe. We've got to just eradicate the cerveza sickness. That's right. We've got to save lives. Got to do whatever to save lives. You see, the, the, the fallacy in that type of thinking, again, goes back to this idea that there are solutions. And if those people could read Thomas Sowell and understand that there are only trade-offs, then again, it takes you to the conclusion, if you just follow it all the way to uh, you know just follow that path where it leads you you come to the conclusion that oh we've got a bunch of really 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 bad options so let's take the least bad one 
And in my in my opinion, there it, it isn't even debatable what the least bad option is. And that's that you allow people to make their own decision. Uh, you try to give them the facts to the best of your ability. You allow an open debate among quote unquote scientists with opposing views. And you allow that uh, debate to be heard by the general public. And then you allow that public to come to the, their own conclusions and to make decisions that they think are correct for themselves, their businesses, their kids, and their family. Now, are you going to have more people dead as a result? Probably. Probably. But what are the alternatives? That we turn into Australia and, and we're sending people off to quarantine camps? Not only if they test positive for the cervical sickness, but if they've even come within proximity of someone? And by the way, what's your end game there? And that's a rhetorical question because there is no end game. With the tools we have, you're, you're dealing with a, a situation where it is literally impossible to achieve something called herd immunity. And in an attempt to do that, you would be requiring people to get, let's just call them boosters, uh, indefinitely, forever. So you would, so, and that's the case because the efficacy wanes so quickly. Then, so we go into these perpetual lockdowns for the rest of our lives. We go into this uh, passport system uh, for the rest of our lives, which not only require you to get the medicine, but also require you to get the medicine once every three months, once every six months. And if you're not, then you're completely excommunicated from society. You get fired, you lose your job, you you know, you can't go to the grocery store. Who knows what else? You can't fly. Who knows what else happens to you, right? So is, is that a price worth paying to save lives? Well, then the question becomes, how many lives? Are we saving uh, 7 billion people? Or are we saving a million? And see, people don't like to have this, this conversation. They don't even like to think about this. Because we as human beings, it's very uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. We like going to the movies where we know that in Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise is going to be able to find some way to create a solution where he not only saves the world, but he saves all of his friends and family members as well. With, with no downside. We like to think that the, the, the reality of the world we live in is just like a Tom Cruise movie. Where there is an actual solution. We just need to think harder about it. <laughs> what we don't realize, again, we're not living in a movie. We are living in a world with imperfect people in an imperfect planet with imperfect systems. And therefore, we have to just do the least bad thing possible. And again, I think when you look at the facts, it's it's not fun to, to think about these things. Uh, but you've got to come to the conclusion that when you do a proper cost-benefit analysis, although there will be costs, it's not debatable. Uh, when you look at the uh, the benefit or the benefits of taking a specific approach over the long term, and especially what that means for our kids and our grandkids, um, valuing freedom over safety is the only way to go here.
How would you recommend? Well, let me check the time here. Yeah, yeah, we, we're good on time. Okay. How would you recommend weighing political and economic risk for individuals working in the U.S. government or as government contractors? Well, it depends on what you see as risk. So if you're someone that is fine taking the medicine, which is, is totally okay. I mean, a lot of people think that I'm anti-medicine, and I'm, I'm really not at all. Uh, I don't think these medicines that we have right now are that great <laughs> because they only last like three months or, you know, the efficacy really starts to go down around three months. Uh, you know, you we just have to have indefinite boosters. If you had actually really a, a, good, a good medicine, uh, you don't have to do that. So these aren't great. But for some people that have certain health conditions, uh, it could be a very prudent risk reward. You just have to come to that conclusion yourself. You should not be coerced into making that decision because that's when we get on a very slippery slope. Regardless, focusing on your question here. So if you're someone that didn't have an issue with uh, taking the medicine, if you're planning on doing that anyway, then uh, you would have a lot less risk than someone that uh, didn't want anything to do with it because you're being forced to take it. Now, as far as your uh, actual position being safe, I think uh, if anyone's got a safe position, it's going to be someone in the government <laughs> right now because they have to have more and more government spending. They have to make up for the lack of dollars that are being created by the, uh, the uh, commercial banking system. And they're only going to be able to do that through deficit spending that's being monetized by the Fed. So the more tr the trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of additional spending that we get from the government, uh, that's most likely going to go through these government contractors or people that are working for the government in some capacity. And therefore, those positions should be pretty secure. As far as the rates that you'll be paid relative to inflation, you could have some problems. And why I, I need to be very specific. I'm talking about consumer price inflation. You could have problems there because I don't think you're going to be getting an, a, a wage increase at a rate that's consistent with uh, the increase in price of your groceries, gas, or housing. So from that standpoint, I would say that there is a risk. But uh, I, I think there's, there's pros and cons there based on the individual. What about a place like Fort Kobe in Panama City? I haven't heard of it, Mark. I, I apologize. I haven't, I haven't heard of that one. My thoughts on multiple citizenship going into the next decade for escaping political problems. I don't see a downside in that. I mean, other than if you've got the resources, you know, if you got a hundred grand to drop on something or 150 grand to drop on a St. Lucia passport, uh, I don't see, I see zero downside in that. I only see upside and that's, that's good asymmetry. That's a good asymmetric bet. <laughs> so if you had the resources, I would definitely consider it. Okay. Oh, here we go from Peter. My good buddy, Peter Frowen. Hopefully we'll see you in Houston, uh, in Houston Peter. Uh, do you think we can stop the Fed coin and put in place our own digital currency, save our freedom? Can we stop the Fed coin? I think the probability is 
is very, very low, Peter. Uh, you know, there, there are no certainties, only probabilities. Th this is about the lowest probability thing I can think of. <laughs> Especially if you've got like a, I mean, if you've got like a five month time horizon, then, the, then uh, it's a different question. But if you've got like a 10 year time horizon, I, I don't, I don't see a world in which we don't have one in 10 years. I hope I'm wrong. Because I think once we get the next significant downturn in the stock market, uh, the next black swan event, and maybe this Obregon or whatever it's called, uh, I'm sure I shouldn't even say that due to YouTube or whatever this next, this last, we'll call it a, a scariant. <laughs> whatever the last scariant instead of variant uh, was, I got to give a hat tip to my good buddy, Ken McElroy, who came up with that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, let's just say, uh, due to the scary end, the stock market continues to go down. It was down almost a thousand points on Friday. So let's say we have a week, then the probability increases significantly, especially if the, the Fed put and the government put have expired. That's going to be their only option, Peter. And how do they unroll it or uh, how do they roll it out? I think they just say, to all the average Joes and Janes, if you want an extra thousand dollars a month or your stimmy check, just go ahead and download the Fed app, and that's done. We got Fed coin. I, I think it'll be a very, very easy rollout if if they so choose, and I think uh, the the probability with that rollout increases uh, with the next downturn in the stock market, and then increases exponentially based on how um, significant that downturn is. Do I buy into the whole prepping concept? Wondering if you have any food reserves. I don't, but one thing I've been thinking, in fact, I actually looked at um, some property online today. I I really like the idea of buying a farm. I really like that idea. Even if we don't get, uh, even if it's just a plan B that I never have to use, I think I would really like to have just food brought to wherever I was. And I, I know most people might not have this option, but if you're just asking what I'm doing personally or my thought process, uh, I was saying, you know what, why don't I just buy a farm if I can find one in Arizona that's even if it's got some fruit trees and maybe the ability to grow some vegetables and just keep some chickens or cattle out there or something. And I could just hire four or five people to manage it for me. And then uh, while, even if I'm not using the property, uh, I'm having those four or five people grow the food and do the upkeep and everything and then bring and transport food into my freezer and refrigerator here in Phoenix. And then I'm able to just, for the most part, unless I'm going out to a restaurant, I'm able to eat food that was just grown on my own farm so I can grow it however I want. And uh, I, I think that's, and then you've got that plan B. And you've got a nice hedge against inflation because I think we're going to see food prices continue to go up. So if you're able to grow the majority of your own food, bonus, huge bonus. And I think uh, that could be a, a very good investment as well. 
So I don't know if I would consider that prepping, but that is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I think I'm, I'm going to definitely continue to kick tires there uh, because I, I like that for a lot of, of reasons. And I'll keep you guys posted. All right. I appreciate the questions, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Let's do some shout outs to end and make sure you're checking out Rebel Capitalist live at rebelcapitalistlive.com. We've got Dr. Ron Paul, Lynn Alden, we've got Mark Moss, we've got Richard Werner, uh, we've got some uh, Chris Cole. We've got an incredible group of speakers. Uh, you guys definitely not going to want to miss out on this one. So get your tickets uh, while they're still there at rebelcapitalistlive.com. And we'll see you in Houston, January 7th to the 9th. But let's do some shout outs here. We've got Mitchell Goslin in the house, Jason Kincaid, Whisper, Abel, Malcolm. Here's one. By, oh, where'd it go? That was a good one. By Warwick, by Warwick, it come. By Warwick, it come. Stacker, New Zealand. <laughs> I'm sure I, I butchered that, but that was really an interesting one. Dwayne Hunt, Dwayne Hunt, quantitative disease. Nate in the house. Ian nu- Nikulescu. Brian Bradley. Gordon Betacek. Anthony Atlas, Market Mania, Canada, Lauren Abig, Free Patriot, E.G., Unvast, Unvaxed, No Mask, Ed, Matthew Silva, Matt Ball, PGRR in the house, Joe G., Holophonic, Michael Herrera, R-E-3-I-R-T-H, Dwayne Hunt, Rum... Ramari Ngiraked, another one I'm sure I'm butchering, Christina Rose, on-site Trav, Leslie Pettit, Eric Anderson, Average Jane, Eric Harrison, Michael Hill, R.C. Stout, Sylvester Askew, Harvey 82, Seymour Rivers, Zauhir, Ben Smye. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you on the next video.